Welcome back to another episode of Auction Talk with Steffes Group. I'm Rusty Halverson, and as always, we've got Max Steffes. How are you doing today, Max? I'm good, man. It's good to be at our home base today. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having us over here. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, uh, we're in the springtime. Uh, weather's not quite cooperating yet for planting, but we're getting close. You know, I'm optimistic. I don't know if it's going to be as late of a spring as everybody thought, but time will tell. Okay. All right. Well, our guest today, uh, Blaine Anderson from Alaris. How are you doing today? I'm doing fantastic. Good, good, good. Well, Max uh, brought you on board today. We're going to talk about interest rates and all sorts of different facets of the farm economy, land values, maybe some equipment values too. But first, Blaine, let's uh, just start off uh, with you. How long uh, you've been doing what you're doing and uh, where are you from? Let's start there. Where are you from? Yes. Uh, North Dakota farm boy. Okay. Um, Grew up by Litchville, North Dakota, on a farm there. Um, back when uh, I graduated high school, farming wasn't as good, so I went to college and uh, got my education in finance and business, and then uh, got in the banking field. So I've been with Alaris for 16 years now, um, 12 of those in the focusing on the egg segment. Okay, where'd you go to college? Moorhead State. Oh, really? MSUM, yep. Okay. Okay, well, 16 years. Um, and I understand uh, you and Max, uh, you've known each other for quite some time, too. Tell me about how you guys met. Yeah, so I met Blaine actually in college. So backstory, before I got involved in the family auction business, I was uh, selling homes, believe it or not. And a mortgage broker invited me to coffee um, in a tips club, so to speak, a networking organization. And Blaine happened to be there, and we kind of hit it off, and our friendship has... Uh, continued on into the auction business. Of course, a lot of parallels with uh, who is he, he is servicing and his clients are our clients and we've kept in touch and I consider Blaine a good friend. Okay, okay, well, uh, let's get uh, maybe into some of the numbers and get your thoughts, Blaine. Uh, we've got some talking points here uh, just to start the conversation. Let's start with uh, today's rates. Uh, your perspective on interest rates, effects on the land market based on what you're hearing and seeing uh, what's your feel of the landscape right now, Blaine? Yeah, so obviously rates have jumped. You look at last year to this year, we're doubled, you know, and that affects um, cash flows. And cash flow is king and egg. Um, we're not going to be like the 80s where it's all land values and you got dirt, you won't get hurt. No, everything in banking is based on cash flow now. So with these doubling of rates, cash flow gets hurt. Um, right now, I think we're kind of topped out on rate. Mm -hmm. Um, the Fed is signaling another quarter point rate raise in the May area um, and then probably flat the rest of the year. Okay. If you look at some of the bond market stuff, they think we're more flat, maybe getting a little reduction yet late this year. So I think we're kind of where we are, but there's been so many black swan events yes. over the last, you know, three, four years. I could be wrong and something can happen tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah, and those black swan events, uh, you can't predict what they are. You talk about the Fed, and I, I had some notes here. Uh, a recent report from the Fed Reserve um, in their ag finance update, they said alongside additional increases in federal fund rates, interest rates on farm loans rising sharply, the average rate the highest since 2007. Um, you've been around for 16 years, uh, uncharted territory, Absolutely. So I've been in this for 16 years. I've never been in a rising rate environment in my career. Wow. It's always been stable or declining. Okay. So this is new. Um, how to deal with it and stuff. Again, you just go right back to cash flow. That is always king in any egg banking scenario. Whenever you're looking at land, equipment, operating, it's all that. Now, the good side of the story is there's so much liquidity with the farm today that my operating lines are at all time low because they have so much cash. So they're not getting hit with that higher interest rate today. Now, as we know, things will change and commodity prices will get normalized and we'll have to get into operating more. Yep, okay. Um, when you talk about commodity prices, um, we have seen a little bit of a softening here, it seems over the last first quarter of the year so far. Um, and in some surveys, uh, such as the CME Purdue Index Survey, Barometer of Agriculture, when they ask producers about some of their concerns, one would be uh, commodity prices and the general uh, shape of the market. Another one that they keep bringing up is interest rates. So it's on the minds of producers. How is that affecting 
what you do as a business and especially what you do in the auction business, Max? Yeah, so when we talk about leading indicators in terms of what's gonna happen next in the machinery and land market, you name two of the most important ones, commodity prices and interest rates. The third would be production. If you don't have something to sell, you're not gonna have a financially viable farm. So um, it's definitely benefited the valuations of uh, farm real estate and farm machinery. And I do think that rates are finally giving some pause to the land market. I'd be curious to hear Blaine's perspective on that, but it just finally feels like it's starting to stabilize things and, and uh, that the tops maybe might be in on the land market. Really? Okay. Blaine, your thoughts? Yeah, I'm going to have to agree with Max on that. It feels like the tops are in on the land market. Um, again, I'm going to go back to so much liquidity out there with the last few years of some of the ad hoc government payments um, and then just good income years on the farm. Um, that's drying up a little bit. So I feel like the tops might be in on the land market and the interest rates are starting to make people really double think. You know, you know that couple in point increase is another hundred dollars an acre expense, interest expense. Do I really need to go there? So they're kind of pulling back a bit. So I, I feel like the tops might be in on the on the land market today. Now, if we have a, a record crop, we're going right back there. Yeah. You know, but right now I think people want to pause, see what happens with this later spring, you know, see how the crops come in. Okay. Um, kind of an aside, but um, we've talked before, Max, about how land values in our part of the world sometimes follow the land values in the heart of the Corn Belt, like the three I states and whatnot. Correct. Um, are we seeing any trends in their prices of topping out something that might translate into our neck of the woods or too soon to tell on that kind of thing, Max? Too soon to tell to some degree, but most of the sales that are occurring are at levels that we saw last fall. Okay. Whereas you, you can compare and contrast last spring to last fall, we saw a 10 to 30% appreciation that occurred in that time frame. So. You know, there's there's good sale prices out there at record levels still, but they're not as numerous and there's no headline busting $30,000 an acre land sales happening once a week like yeah. we saw in December of last year. So yeah. that would tell you that the trends are, are cooling to some degree and, and rates is a big part of that. So, Blaine, do you have any horror stories from your 16 years in the biz? Um, for example, <laughs> um, quote, Hey, I bought some land yesterday and need a loan in 20 days, end quote. Come to one of our auctions and call Blaine up. <laughs> uh, yes, I have horror stories. Okay. Uh, and that, though, that's probably the most common one. Really? Absolutely. You know, I'll get uh, a producer who is very viable, but they'll buy something from Steffes mm -hmm. um, or one of the other auction companies or a private sale or what have you and say, uh, maybe 10 days or two weeks later, oh yeah, I bought some land I need to close in 15 days. <laughs> like, uh, there's their steps to it, right? Yep. Um, and sometimes uh, maybe you should not close on time, but I do my best to do that. Now it costs some more money. You have to get the appraisal sped up. That's about double the cost. Um, you have to get on the title uh, insurance or the attorney, the O&E stuff and get that sped up. Now that's double the cost if you want it faster. So you pay for not being responsible and being out in front. So the right way to deal with that is, always get pre-approved. If you're looking at land, go talk to your banker. Um, number one, see if you can do it, because you don't want to have egg on your face if you can't, um, because then you do lose your earnest money. And Max, I don't know, do you see that very often on people having to turn back earnest money, or is it pretty people work with it and delay closing maybe a little bit? or? Well, yeah, and we, we, we have a lot of teeth in it. I mean, generally speaking, if we're selling a quarter of land for a million dollars, they're going to put a hundred thousand down, a 10% downstroke. So it's difficult to walk away. And, you know, we try to do a good job in communicating with people like Blaine to ensure that we're having a timely close because ultimately we represent the seller and we want a timely close. And part of that is having an organized buyer. And I would echo what Blaine said. We appreciate it when buyers and bidders show up at our auction sales and have already talked to somebody like Blaine and have their ducks in a row because that's typically a confident buyer that's gonna bid up toward that price. And as an auctioneer, you appreciate buyers in that regard because it makes the auction go along quicker and, and um, there's, there's less trepidation and hesitation from the buyer perspective. So I just encourage those producers that are listening now to have those conversations in advance. Uh, people like Blaine, they're your partners. They're your partners in your business and you need to view things that way. And part of that is, you know, just like your wife, 
what happens when you don't communicate with your wife? Things don't go very good, as I know firsthand. So <laughs> I'd, I'd echo what Blaine said. Um, you know, treat people like you would like to be treated. Communicate and keep those lines of communication open, especially when you're going to go out and spend $2 million on some land. Yeah, yeah. You're talking a large purchase, maybe the biggest purchase of your life. Um, for one, walking into the situation, just having peace of mind for all parties involved, that it's got to go a long way to making the transaction a heck of a lot more smooth. Yeah. And when we hear about a, a banker like Blaine um, financing a deal, you know, a week prior to closing and we, we reach out to them and they go, oh, uh, it's an uncomfortable feeling for us and them. So I can't reiterate that enough. OK. Yeah. And, there, and there's a touch on one other thing, too, that is very important when you're talking to your banker beforehand. Um, we do scenario planning. OK, we're at the auction. What happens when this happens? What happens when it gets bit up or what are we going to do? What's that going to do to your liquidity working capital? Is that, are you comfortable with that? So we get through all those steps of where that price might be. So you walk in, you know exactly where you're going to sit and how that makes you feel, where that price is. Okay. All right. Um, a scenario uh, when it comes to a piece of land. Um, the auction process is going along and maybe you see um, two bidders that really want that land. If the bidder is prepared, like how high are we going to go? He's had a conversation with you. Have you ever seen emotion take over at an auction sale? Oh, absolutely. That's, when it that's, comes to a piece of land. That's kind of our uh, dream scenario as auctioneers. We call those referee matches where we're just talking and yeah. they're, they're doing all the work for us. But, uh, you know, land is sacred and uh, you get those scenarios where maybe a piece is across the road from one producer and another producer is two miles down the road and they're, they're both in a cash position and have an ability to basically pay substantially more when the, what the market would dictate at that given time. Um, those are good scenarios for us. And, you know, oftentimes to their defense, that's the only shot they're going to get in the next hundred years. So yeah, they're going to overpay for it relative to what other stuff has sold for, but that's the name of the deal with land. It's always too damn much money, yep. you know? So, yeah. Now, Blaine, have, have you ever had a conversation maybe prior to a land sale where the potential buyer tells you how much it means to him and do you try to, oh, not talk him down or talk him out of it, but do you try to coach or advise on, you know, if you want to go to this limit, this ceiling on this piece of land, is it truly worth it to you? Oh, absolutely. You have to coach him on that. Um, the one that I always come up with that it's, it's a little harder is the home quarter. Mm -hmm. You know, the home quarter came up. You're going to probably go quite a bit over market to get that. Um, and as a banker, you have to you have to realize that's a reality, right? So um, and be okay with it. So it still has the cash flow and things like that. But going over market, and just let them know you're gonna have to put more equity in. I still have my certain loan to values. You got to put more cash down to get that. But I totally understand why you go over market. Now, if it's a quarter that's 20 miles away from your other land, I would highly discourage somebody to go over market. Why would you go over market? if it doesn't fit well in your operation. So every, every piece of land has its own story. Yeah, it certainly does. And Max, it's part of your job to tell that story too. Absolutely, yep, that's what we do best. Let's talk about uh, rates. What is it doing to equipment financing? What have you kind of seen? Because Max and I, we've been visiting uh, for the better part of the last year about how these equipment values are holding so firm and guys want that good used equipment. Um, what are you seeing, uh, seeing from your side of the equation? Yeah, I mean, the values of equipment is sky high, and I think that's a supply-demand function of it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and interest rates are high on equipment also. Same as land. I mean, we're, we're again, double or more on, on equipment. Um, leasing isn't really a thing right now. Um, so, yeah, the, it is affecting, um, but guys can't get their hands on stuff, so they're willing to step up. Mm -hmm. So interest rates are affecting. Again, I think it will, as the year goes on, um, interest rates will affect that more when supply comes back in. Okay. Um, from your side of the equation, as an auctioneer, Max, and as a seller, um, how do you think that will play into future sales? Well, I think, you know, from a buyer perspective, it's, it's important to pay attention to the supply chains. And eventually these supply chains are going to catch up and certain segments are going to catch up before others. 
So say for example, a Timpty Hopper bottom trailer. You can get those this summer, late summer, from my based on my understanding. So, sure. being conscious of that when you're going out and making that purchase as a buyer is something that uh, you should be doing as a producer if you're making a major machinery purchase. So interest rates, um, you know, like Blaine said, I'd agree with you that it just really hasn't been relevant because there's a need there from from a fulfillment of the duty that the machinery will do, mm -hmm. and the producer needs to upgrade that piece or needs that additional piece to get the work done. Yep doesn't really matter what interest rates are. You've got to go farming, yep. you know. I have one other thing to add on to that. I had a conversation yesterday with a, a really good farmer. Um, labor is an issue. Yes. So he's like, do I get an H2A? I can't find a, a young kid to help. I just got to increase my planter size. I have to, and I have to pay the price. So that's there too. Labor is a big issue on the farm side. Okay. Yeah, that's a really good point. In fact, um, we don't talk politics, but uh, when it comes to labor and trying to fi uh, figure out the H-2A um, situation in Washington, D.C., that's a conversation that's ongoing, but we won't drag you into that. Yeah. Kind of thing. <laughs> we'll leave that to Joel. There you go. There you go. Um, operating renewals um, and interest rates in that realm of the business. What have you been seeing, Blaine? Um, so operating renewal season is just wrapping up here for, for all egg bankers, uh, myself included, and my team over at Alaris. Um, it, it was probably the easiest and funnest renewal season because cash flows are so strong. Well, that's good. So that's good for the, the local farmers. Um, that's good to see. Um, it's good for the local economy because farm runs the uh, big majority of the economy here locally. Um, interest rates are higher, though. Wall Street Prime, which a lot of this stuff is a tier one borrower, is 8% right now. That's pretty high. And probably gonna go up another quarter percent here in May. That's eight and a quarter. So um, I do see that coming down, as I said, maybe end of this year into next year. But that increases, again, doubles your interest expense, which nobody even looked at as an expense the last 10 years. Because it's been so minute. I mean, we're at 4% operating for, for a long time. 2023 and beyond. I mean, we're just starting this year. We're still trying to put a crop in the ground. You said one of those leading indicators is production. We won't know that until this fall. But if you had to make predictions, if you had a crystal ball, what do you see going into maybe this time next year, Blaine? As far as rates go, mm -hmm. I would say my crystal ball, and this is Blaine's opinion, not Alaris's. <laughs> um, uh, yep. I would say we are down 50 basis points from today. Okay. At this time next year. Really? I do. I really think that. It, if you just look at the Fed, which is the most conservative, like I said, they're a quarter up, flat to maybe getting down in fourth quarter a little bit. The bond market's saying we're flat and we're going to start going down already. The third and fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. Bond market is where the money's played. So I kind of get a little bit closer to them. So that's why I'm about a 50% cut or 50 basis point cut this time next year. But and it's continue to go down from there. But again, you know, you mentioned Black Swan event. Correct. Yep. Yeah, you talk about, you know, the last three years, COVID, Ukraine, all those events with the stroke of a pen, things change so quickly mm -hmm. in agriculture and uh, something to be aware of. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Can't be predicted, but um, if you plan for the um, unexpected, I guess you could say. Amen. Yeah, you got to weather the storm. Yes. As a banker, that's where working capital comes in. That is the black swan insurance. So keep the working capital healthy. Your farm will be healthy. Okay. And that's a valuable perspective when you, you think about the longevity of a farm. You know, these cycles are typically far and few between. It took us eight years for land values to get back to where they were from 2012 and 2013. And, uh, you know, as producers, um, Blaine's having these conversations every year. How do we manage and weather that next storm, that next down cycle? And uh, it's all about ones and, you know, singles and doubles, not home runs. Yeah. And uh, that's always been the name of the game in production agriculture. So something to be conscientious of because things have to correct at some point here and in the foreseeable future. Let's talk... Uh, uh a black swan event. Um, let's talk about the strong regional banks in agriculture now yeah. and in the future. In fact, uh, I have in the, the latest Purdue University CME Group Ag Economy Barometer, um, several 
this is of bankers and others. Um, rising interest rates, weaker prices for key commodities from mid-February through mid-March, key factors behind a lower sentiment reading. Producers pointing to the cost of inputs and rising interest rates as number one concerns. But also um, the rural Main Street Index, um, Ernie Goss, Creighton University. Um, in his April report, more than three of four or 72, or make that 76.2% of bank CEOs opposing the recent bailout of Silicon Valley Bank and Signature Bank. Um, two thirds of bank CEOs opposing all bank bailouts. Now those big bank bailouts, they don't necessarily pertain to our regional banks that generally have a lot more strength. Would that be fair to say, Blake? Yeah, that'd be very fair. Um, it's a total different structure. Um, they were more the investor, um, angel fund investor type uh, banks, Silicon Valley, some crypto, some of that stuff, uh, a large percent of uninsured um, deposits. Which you get to the Midwest, it's not that way. I mean, we are very spread across and very capitalized. Um, so I do not foresee anything coming to the Midwest or, or the heart of the regional banks um, of any struggle coming there, so. Okay, when some of these big banks uh, hit the headlines, did you have any conversations with folks trying to explain to them that their situation is nothing to do with what we've got going on in our neck of the woods. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, people get scared, right? Am I gonna lose my deposits? This is happening, is this gonna, you know, contagion? Is it gonna go to all the regional banks? Uh, Alaris is a regional bank, a large regional bank, um, along with the, most of the people that serve the egg community are regional banks. You get to the big nationals, they pulled out of the egg mm -hmm. years ago. It's regional banks that can offer these long-term locks, you know, some of the other stuff that, that you need as a farm. And they, the regional banks need the farm just as much or more. So there is nothing that uh, I foresee um, to contagion coming into the Midwest banks, but you have to uh, still be on top of good management, um, diversify um, different industries. Um, a good regional bank is not gonna be 100% egg bank. That's just you're going to have a little bit in each bucket to diversify. So generally the egg economy is counter cyclical to the economy. So having a nice egg portfolio in a bank is good because when the economy kind of tanks, which kind of is now, egg is up. When it goes the other way, commodity price is lower, the economy is doing well, but egg struggles a bit. So you have to have a balance there and good management at a bank will do that. And also, according to that rural Main Street index plane, uh, about 64% of bankers reported depositors exiting due to higher financial risks, uh, checking deposits, plummeting to a record low. But again, these aren't things we're seeing in the Midwest. That's somewhere else. The strength of the regional banks, the people we know and the people we work with on a daily basis, kind of the backbone of what we have here in the upper Midwest? Yep. In agriculture, the backbone is relationships. If it's with Stephas, or with Alaris, or your banker, whoever that is, there's a, there's a lot of good regional banks and regional bankers that we have, we're blessed with. Relationship always is key. You have to visit, um, and your banker should be watching. You know, rates are higher on deposits. You're getting paid today. So you should be getting paid a return. And the regional bankers, they'll pick up the phone and say, here, we, we need to increase this. Um, so I haven't seen the run on uh, any deposits leaving the door locally. It's those sleepy banks that aren't paying attention. You're more of a number that uh, the, the exit will happen on the deposits. So it is very important, again, relationship, relationship, and the strength of a regional bank and the um, producer is, is paramount, in my opinion. Okay. Um, any thoughts on that, Max? Yeah, you know, we, we saw it in the 80s. There was a lot of people that had the rug pulled out from under them. Grandpa lived it, dad lived it. Um, you know, there was chosen few from, from people that were allowed to continue to farm because they were, so, so to speak, too big to fail. And there was those that my grandpa would tell you I should have never been sold out. So having that relationship um, with, with that egg banker is paramount. And I think that's something that's important for Blaine at Alaris, that, uh, you know, that commitment that's there from a, from a good time. You know, of course, everything goes good in the good times, yep. you know, until it doesn't and things aren't so good. 
And I think that's really when the relationships are important, that uh, that, that individual is going to go advocate for you from a, from a credit department when they're having those tough conversations. And also from a perspective of, you know, moving into that, looking at your balance sheet and, um, you know, weathering yourself for, for that impending storm that we know is going to cycle and come at some point. Well, Blaine, thank you so much. Again, uh, Blaine Anderson from Alaris. Um, thanks for your insights today. We really appreciate it. And uh, if people would want to reach out to you, is there a good way to get in touch with Alaris and uh, maybe have a conversation about some of the things we've talked about today? Yeah, um, I would reach out to me. It's uh, blaine.anderson at alaris.com. I'm located right here in West Fargo. Um, we have a great team up and down the Red River Valley um, in, in Grand Forks, uh, in Northwood, and down here. We also have in the cities in Arizona, but for the, the heart of the Red River Valley um, is where egg bankers are. So reach out to me and I can get you lined up to the, uh, the right egg banker in your area, or we'll just uh, have a cup of coffee and, and visit here. Okay. Max, always good to have a cup of coffee with you. Yeah, just like Blaine, everything starts with a conversation, right? Yep, Whether absolutely. you're thinking about having an auction or changing banks or you need a banker, you know, pick up the phone. So yeah. I'm always up for some coffee. Yeah, and uh, when it comes to coffee, uh, lots of conversations. I mean, we're in the planting season now, uh, but uh, the auction season is going to be getting really busy for you guys, I know, coming up this, this summer. And then, well, before you know it, it's going to be fall, Max. Yeah, before you know it, yeah, June is our next major selling season, so we're looking forward to that. A lot of deferred business from a, from an April April and March perspective, just with the snowpack the way it was. So we're looking forward to another busy selling season in June. Okay, well, uh, thanks again for your time today, gentlemen. Um, Max Steffes, Blaine Anderson, thank you. And you've been listening to Auction Talk with Steffes Group on the Mighty 790 and 104.7 KFGO.